Generally speaking, there are two categories that new writers fall into when it comes to description. Those who over-describe and those who under-describe. When I wrote my first novel 10 years ago, I under-described everything, believing that description was meant to be as sparse as possible, only included so that the reader could see the scene. People often lean one way or the other, but it's also common to over-describe certain parts of your story and under-describe others. For example, you might over-describe scene description at the starts of scenes, when you're trying to introduce your reader to a new setting, but then you might under-describe during dialogue when you're more focused on what the characters say rather than where they are saying it. This is commonly referred to as white room syndrome, since the characters are talking in a blank, undescribed place. Let's first take a look at both types of description, as well as some ideas of how to fix them. Let's say you're writing a scene that takes place in a kitchen. You write the scene as you see it in your head, perhaps focusing on dialogue between characters rather than setting, since you assume everyone can imagine what a kitchen looks like. Maybe you simply say, Henry walks into the kitchen and leans against the counter. A bowl of fruit sits in front of him. That's a pretty sparse description, and perhaps you know that specific details make scenes come alive. So you might change it to say that he leans against the blue quartz counter, and a bowl of bananas sits in front of him. But is that actually a better description than the previous one? It's more specific in its details, but it doesn't really tell us anything about the characters, conflict, or world of the story. The story would be no different if those details were not included. So now I'd like to step back for a moment and decide, is this description an example of over-describing or under-describing? Maybe you'd need to see the rest of the scene to know for sure, but even with just these sentences, I would argue that it is both. You see, the reason that over-describing and under-describing are both problems for writers is because neither leave the reader with a memorable image in their head. An under-described scene takes place in an empty white space, where there's literally nothing for the reader to remember. But an over-described scene packs so many irrelevant details into a description that they begin to blur together into a fuzzy mass that's impossible for readers to separate into important details versus unimportant ones. Even if readers don't actually skim these overpacked descriptions, their brain does the work of skimming for them by tossing the entire description out and remembering nothing. It's too messy and too monotonous to be memorable, and you are essentially left with a white room. So, what are the solutions to these problems? A good starting place is to incorporate at least one of these three keys to memorable description. Emotion, viewpoint, or potential energy. Returning to our earlier sentence, let's take a look at emotion first. Henry marches into the kitchen and braces himself against the counter. His uneaten breakfast glares back at him from the overflowing fruit bowl. Marches, braces, and glares are all active verbs that convey anger and agitation at Henry's current lack of control over his world. Even his breakfast glares at him. The words uneaten and overflowing insinuate that this is a regular occurrence for this character. He might desperately seek control in his life, but has not been able to have it for some time now. Now let's write the sentence through the lens of the character, focusing exclusively on his viewpoint, what he notices and interacts with in the room, and leaving out any extraneous details that he wouldn't pay attention to. Henry enters the kitchen like he always does, but his stomach isn't up for breakfast this morning, not after last night. He leans against the counter, his sweaty palms leaving smudges on the cold stone. Stone that no longer belongs to him. Six decades in this house, gone in six minutes at a card table. This description ignores aspects of the room that the character wouldn't notice in this scene. He's too preoccupied to identify a bowl of fruit, and instead carelessly calls it breakfast in his internal narrative. He also highlights the feel of the counter against his hands, since it's a sharp contrast to his skin, as well as a further sign of something he's lost control of. By smudging the stone, he has created another mess that he must now clean. Another way to add life to your description is by focusing on potential energy. The setting and description in your scenes don't have to be static. In fact, they should be an active participant in the story. Readers should recognize that when they encounter description in your novel, it's not something that they want to skim. It isn't just irrelevant scene dressing, but a necessary piece of the story that would leave the narrative incomplete if it were to be removed. For example, you might say, Henry walks into the kitchen, still vibrating from the night before, unprepared for the searing beams of sunlight now attacking every nocturnal beast it can find whether curious beetle or drunken man. They're all left hunched and hissing in non-existent shadows while the sun scorches the room. The description in this scene is more active than the character himself. Every item in the room has an agenda, from the sunlight streaming in to the beetles running for cover. This is a scene filled with potential energy. 
Now, I understand these sentences might not be the best sentences you've ever seen, but I hope they help you imagine what description can be, rather than the simple listicle style of description that many new writers rely on. A second thing I like to consider when writing description is whether or not I'm using enough concrete words. Our brains are wired to remember physical, tactile experiences rather than abstractions or concepts. In fact, our brain has no contact with our surroundings except through its interactions with our five senses – sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell. Items that we can interact with physically leave a much stronger impression on us than abstract concepts that we can't see or hold or taste. Someone could say to you, hey, remember that time we almost got arrested on the beach? And you'd be like, yeah, I remember that. I cut my feet on the shells and led the cops straight to us with a blood trail. That's a fine memory. You might share a chuckle with your friend and then move on. But what if you were just walking along one day, living your life, and you suddenly encounter the coppery stench of blood coating your nostrils and the sharp wailing sting of a siren against your ears. Maybe the stale ventilation on a subway blows salty air against your cheeks, speckling your skin with flecks of soot and sewage, and you're suddenly transported back to that night on the beach, one that you had mostly forgotten about until this moment. That is what you want to capture with your description. That visceral, unavoidable memory brought to life in your mind almost against your will. Concrete, tactile words are the only way to achieve this. Abstract words, such as emotions or concepts, do have their place in fiction, especially in the more pointed discussions of emotion or meaning. But in general, it will always be more effective to describe the experience of anger rather than saying the character is angry. The powdery laundry soap that makes you remember your childhood piano teacher whenever you happen across it in the store. Thick, gummy noodles that only you enjoy since they make you think of your grandmother at Christmas making her infamous noodles every year. That one obscure pop song you listen to on repeat for three weeks after your first real heartbreak, and when it comes on unexpectedly at the dentist's office, it makes your heart clench and tears choke your throat even though you're happily married now and haven't thought about that lost love in years. That is the power of tactile description. Don't say grief. Make me grieve. Tactile versus metaphorical description. Writers often fall into the trap of thinking that metaphorical description needs to be abstract, that metaphor somehow also equals vague. This belief sours the writing of both poets and novelists alike, because that actually isn't the case at all. Let's return to Henry in his kitchen. Henry struts into the kitchen with the lazy arrogance of a man who's never needed the space, like the CEO entering a subordinate's office. The bananas and kiwis quake beneath his fingertips as he makes a show of selecting the next ripe fruit to be filleted. Again, this is just a sentence I've come up with on the fly, but can you see how visceral details bring the metaphor to life? The description could have been left at, Henry struts into the kitchen with the lazy arrogance of a man who's never needed the space. But arrogance is an abstract word that could mean a million different things to a million different people when used by itself. But when bananas and kiwis quake like employees, it creates an image in your reader's mind. And that image emphasizes that people and fruit are both terrified to be next on the chopping block. Description in mystery novels. Strategic use of over and under describing can be used to create an intelligent, solvable mystery that your readers will love. What you choose to describe and what you choose to skip helps weave the mystery in your reader's mind. Maybe your narrative style includes a few detailed descriptions on innocuous items, only so that you can include the single clue that will crack the case wide open at the end of the novel, and your reader can go, I should have known. Perhaps Henry has bananas in his fruit bowl even though he's allergic to tropical fruit, so your reader has to put together that A, bananas are tropical fruit, and B, that must mean Henry includes them in his fruit bowl for someone else, like a secret lover. Or C, someone gave him bananas out of spite or even ignorance, and he decided to keep them as a strange and macabre reminder of his own mortality. That one tiny detail included in your description, a banana, could lead to all of that in your reader's mind if you layer your story in an engaging enough manner. The possibilities are endless! And this layering is done through description. Lists of descriptions are a hallmark of new writers. They can also be an excellent way of dropping clues into your mystery that most readers will simply breeze right past without even registering them or properly digesting their meaning. For example, in the film Knives Out, spoilers ahead, the audience is clued into the fact that the Thrombies' dogs only bark at ransom. Then later, we are told that the dogs barked in the middle of the night when Harling was killed. The story literally tells us right there that Ransom was sneaking back into the house for unknown reasons, but we're too preoccupied with hoping Marta escapes that we don't stop to process what it means to hear dogs barking in the night. These small details, left in unassuming places, are so fun for readers to find later on, 
after they've finished your novel and are flipping back through the pages to find all of the points in the story where they could have solved the mystery if only they'd paid a little more attention or paused to question certain details. Examples from published books. Now let's take a look at some descriptions from published novels. First, from Ellen Raskin's classic middle grade novel, The Westing Game. The sun sets in the west. Just about everyone knows that. But Sunset Towers faced east. Strange. Sunset Towers faced east and had no towers. This glittery, glassy apartment house stood alone on the Lake Michigan shore, five stories high. Five empty stories high. Then one day, it happened to be the 4th of July, a most uncommon-looking delivery boy rode around town, slipping letters under the doors of the chosen tenants to be. The letters were signed, Barney Northrup. The delivery boy was 62 years old, and there was no such person as Barney Northrup. This playful passage includes a mixture of concrete and abstract language to appeal to young readers, and it also makes heavy use of blatant contradictions in order to pique the reader's interest and emphasize the air of mystery that this story will contain. For avid readers, it also contains a clue to the novel's final reveal here on the very first page, but I won't spoil it for you. Next, from Stuart Turton's Innovative Whodunit, The Seven and a Half Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle. There's a stream away to my right, and crows in the trees, their wings cracking in the air as they take flight. Something is scurrying in the undergrowth, the thump of rabbit feet passing near enough to touch. One by one, I knit these new memories together until I've got five minutes of past to wrap myself in. It's enough to staunch the panic, at least for now. I get to my feet clumsily, surprised by how tall I am, how far from the ground I seem to be. Swaying a little, I wipe the wet leaves from my trousers, noticing for the first time that I'm wearing a dinner jacket the shirt splattered with mud and red wine. I must have been at a party. My pockets are empty and I don't have a coat, so I can't have strayed too far. That's reassuring. This description of the main character describing themselves is more detailed than many authors would dare to be. It includes intentional listicles to ground the reader in the idea that this character does not know who or where they are, and is merely listing details as a coping strategy. The character evaluates each detail as they come to it, but rather than boring the reader with unnecessary exposition, it lets us into the character's head and helps us feel their panic at the thought that literally every single thing around them is unknown. And lastly, from Donna Tartt's cult classic literary novel, The Secret History, we get this initial description of the novel's primary professor. Among the few people I had met who'd been at Hamden a while, I asked what the story was with Julian Morrow. Nearly everyone had heard of him, and I was given all sorts of contradictory but fascinating information that he was a brilliant man, that he was a fraud, that he had no college degree, that he had been a great intellectual in the 40s, and a friend to Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot, that his family money had come from a partnership in a white shoe banking firm, or, conversely, from the purchase of foreclosed property during the Depression, that he had dodged the draft in some war, though chronologically this was difficult to compute, that he had ties with the Vatican, a deposed royal family in the Middle East, Franco's Spain. The degree of truth in any of this was, of course, unknowable. But the more I heard about him, the more interested I became, and I began to watch for him and his little group of pupils around campus. Four boys and a girl. They were nothing so unusual at a distance. At close range, though, they were an arresting party, at least to me, who had never seen anything like them, and to whom they suggested a variety of picturesque and fictive qualities. This is a unique description because it is being given to us second-hand, perhaps even third-hand. The character is telling us what he has been told by other students. So we are getting a description of a person this character has never even encountered yet, which draws us in and gives the professor a heightened sense of intrigue. We, like the character, are left wanting to know more. We want to meet this man firsthand and see if these details match the real man. So there you have it. The best tips I have for writing engaging description and for using description to help pace your novel, involve your reader, weave mystery, and set the tone. I hope you found this helpful, and if you did, I'd love for you to like and subscribe to my channel. Thank you!